Hello and welcome to Chapter 3 in Financial Statement Analysis. This chapter we're going to talk about financing activities and how a business finances their, their organization. Typically they finance their organization with either liabilities or um, stock equity. And we're going to talk a little bit about each one of those as well as something called off-balance sheet financing. And to kind of give us an idea of what things we want to look at when we're doing our analysis. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is they use different sources to, to, um, to finance their operations. One of those are liabilities, and they have both long-term and short-term liabilities. They use capital, which is in the stockholders' equity section of the balance sheet. And then there's also off-balance sheet transactions that a company or an organization use to finance their organization. Liabilities um, is the first one. And we're going to touch on liabilities first. What are the two major types of liabilities? We have operating liabilities and financing liabilities. If it makes it easier for you, look at operating liabilities as things that you would need in the short term to run your business. And you notice they have unearned uh, accounts payable, unearned revenue, advance payments, tax payable, etc. For the most part, what you're looking at is um, current liabilities, and sometimes they might call this an operating loan for a business, which is a little bit different than uh, longer term liabilities. But basically, they're used to pay for operating expenses and for the ongoing operations of the business. Financing liabilities typically are going to be much more long-term debt. Mortgage payable, bonds payable, notes payable, leases, and the like. Leases is probably a big one that you're maybe a little bit familiar with, but not a bunch. And you notice it also has your current uh, portion of long-term debt. One good different, one primary differentiation between the two, not always, but a good way to look at it. To simplify the process is financing liabilities are generally going to have interest associated with them. What are the key features when we're analyzing liabilities? What are the terms of indebtedness? How are they going to pay it back? What's the interest rate? What's the payment pattern? And what's kind of interesting, a lot of liabilities you see in business or in industry are different than what we typically see. A business may go out and borrow $10 million dollars and all they're going to do is make principal payments on that loan for a period of time. They might borrow it or they might set uh, issue a bond. But more often than not, they're only going to pay the principal and no interest. And what will happen is maybe it comes to maturity after 10 years and they have to pay back that $10 million. That's what a lot of the terms of indebtedness are. And that's a little bit different than what we see in our own personal lives. Because in our personal lives, what we do is we will make a principal and interest payment not just a principal payment, but a principal and interest payment to pay off a loan. So after 10 years, unlike a business, we will have paid off that loan. We don't have a balloon payment at the end where we're just paying the interest. We're paying both as we go. Um, and so that's one of the things. Some loans will have restrictions. Sometimes they call those covenants on what they can do with their business activities. They might say, for example, a business can't have a cash balance fall below a certain number. And if there's other uh, things that might impact the flexibility of a business in pursuing other financing, that may also be a restriction in that. In that. And uh, the next one, obligations for working capital, different ratios and such. They have to keep track of those within a business to make certain they're in compliance with whatever their loan says that they need to do. And finally, uh, things that you can't spend money on. Maybe... Maybe it's a loan for a, a privately held business and they say that you can't give money to family. Or it says you can't pay dividends during this given period of time. So what does this lead to? Some of these things, the liabilities you have, really show that they, that they are in the first place. In other words, the uh, equity, common stockholders and preferred stockholders are subordinate or lesser than liabilities. Liability people would be that would get their money first before shareholders would get their get their money. Um, how are liabilities classified on a balance sheet? Uh, current and long term or non-current is, is the best way to look at that the liabilities. And typically your the current liabilities, you're going to use something called the current ratio, which you're going to use in your financial analysis. And you're comparing current and long term li current liabilities with the current assets. And typically you want that ratio to be greater than one, much greater than one. If it's less than one, that tells you that you have an issue. And, uh, but it's really pretty much within the operating cycle. 
and it says within one year or the operating cycle, whichever is longer. And you say, well, what other what business would have an operating cycle that's longer than a year? Well, how about Spirit? Uh, you know, I think you've probably seen this commercial with Mia, Mila Kunis or Mia Kunis with Jim Beam, where the she said well, this baby will be ready for me in nine years or whatever it is. I don't remember the number of years. But their operating cycle for that type of business is not one year. It's going to be much longer. You have the same issue with, say, a fruit orchard or a vegetable orchard where they have to grow trees. And they might take six or seven or eight years before those trees go into production. So that's a little bit different as far as current liabilities. And obviously, long-term liabilities are going to have a longer cycle. And that's going to be bonds and mortgage payable and notes payable. Typically, it's going to have interest associated with it. Another form of financing or financing source that you can find within a business. And remember this, sometimes when you look at a balance sheet, if you kind of think about this for just a minute, the um, if you look at a, excuse me, a statement of cash flows, in the statement of cash flows, the financing section is all the way to the bottom. And it's going to show all these different things that a business has done to finance their business. The one thing that you will look at is the operating stuff is going to be in the operating section but all of the financing stuff is in the last section of the balance sheet. I mean, the other statement of cash flows, pardon me. But we're gonna talk specifically now about capital or stockholders equity. And what are the basic characteristics and how is it analyzed? Well, you have equity, it's ownership shares. I know you're very familiar with that. And it reflects the claims that owners have or shareholders on the assets of a business. And there's typically subordinate to creditors. And there's variation of risk but typically, um, they, um, they have the most risk and the most uh, return, potential return. And um, that's why people are willing to buy shares of stock. You know, it's this particular one is an uh, old share of stock for AT&T or American Telegraph, Telephone and Telegraph Company, AT&T. Equity analysis looks at the characteristics and distinguishing the different so equity sources looks at the rights for equity classes. You have several different equity classes. You might have two or three different types of common stock within one business. Um, it has some legal restrictions, typically. Sometimes that's going to be par or stated value. And you can look at restrictions on, on how they distribute retained earnings. Some of that stuff happens in the analysis uh, of the equity section. And if there's terms, uh, the provisions of the equity issuance is what they are. And you have two basic components. You have capital stock and retained earnings. Capital stock, as many of you are aware, is preferred stock and common stock. Preferred is I would kind of call preferred stock a hybrid between common between common stock and bonds, because preferred stock typically is going to be either cumulative or non-cumulative as far as dividends. But you have preferred stock, and they have a percent. Uh, dividend ratio with preferred stock, common stock does not. Common by nature doesn't have that issue. But if you're doing your analysis and you find out that you have preferred stock, you need to adjust your analysis for the preferred stock and what they would have to pay out for dividends based off of that. Because most of your analysis is going to be return on common equity, so you might want to pay close attention to that. Paid in capital, really preferred in common stock are truly paid in capital to capital to the business, but you will also see on a balance sheet paid in capital in excess of par or paid in capital in excess of stated value for common and preferred stock. So that's, it's just another category and the only difference is it's a difference between what somebody paid for a share of stock and what the par or stated value was of that stock. Um, and the, la the last two here, retained earnings, that's really net income less any dividends uh, that a company uh, issues uh, that are made that are kept in the company to continue to grow the company. It's really a accumulation of net income in the business in, in its simplest form. There's other parts to it, but that's a pretty good example. And treasury stock is stock that the company buys back into the business for mul multiple reasons. And we're going to go into a little bit more detail on each one of these. Um, preferred stock, uh, stock features, uh, stock with features not present uh, possessed by common stock. And really the biggest things are dividend distribution preferences and liquidation preferences. And they can do a convertibility or a redemption into common stock. There's call provisions. And one of the interesting things about preferred stock, no voting rights. 
and um, the common stock is stock ownership interest and um, and bearing ultimate risk it takes the risk within the business it really gets residual interest of the company profits in other words you're going to go bondholders preferred shareholders and then finally common stock but they there's a risk return trade-off there's a finance axiom and the common shareholders have the biggest risk but they also anticipate anticipate the biggest return so that's that uh, those are the two shares of capital stock if you continue this paid in capital really is um, for preferred stock or common stock it's an excess of par value or stated value as we touched on earlier treasury stock or some companies call buybacks is actually stock reacquired and issued and fully fully paid for it's a contra equity account and it reduces both the assets and shareholders you say how does it reduce the assets well they pay cash for it so they credit cash and they debit shareholders equity so if you're looking at the statement of shareholders equity or the equity section has treasury stock, that's going to be a minus. And it's typically recorded at cost. So that's a treasury stock. And you might see that in your balance sheet. And companies will buy treasury stock for multiple reasons. One of which is maybe they have an employee stock ownership plan and they have to buy treasury stock in order to get it to their employees. Retained earnings, we touched on just a little bit ago. It's capital of the company, it's accumulation of undistributed earnings or losses since the inception. And it's retained earnings is the main source of dividend distributions. So if you saw a company that had a debit balance, which would imply that a, a large debit balance, that would imply that at some point in the history of a company, it had a large loss. That would tell you that, um, that would tell you that at some point in time, a company had a large loss. You have a couple of different types of dividends. A cash dividend is when they send the check and a stock dividend is basically they're going to not send you a check but they're going to give you more shares of stock the only difference between the two is the cash dividend doesn't change the number of shares outstanding and typically a stock dividend will increase the number of shares outstanding so it dilutes the value of the shares that you have there's prior period adjustments or after adjustments that have happened in prior years for whatever reason and you have appropriations, which are classifications of retained earnings for specific purposes. And a lot of this you'll find in the notes of the financial statements. And the same one on the bottom, restrictions or covenants on retained earnings. Some debt covenants will say that you cannot, you cannot give dividends if you make, if there's certain stipulations on when or when or when or when not you can give dividends. So that's uh, restrictions on retained earnings. What are the sources of increases uh, and decreases of shareholders equity? Um, well, obvi the obvious ones are increases. You can issue stock. You can convert debentures, debentures, which are basically a type of bond. You can issue issuances of stock and acquisitions and mergers. Same thing, still issuances. And another issuance. So, so three out of the four here are issuances. And the, and the fourth one is just a conversion of, of uh, bonds to stock. The sources of decrease, the stock buybacks, which is treasury stock, uh, retirement of stocks. The company might want to retire shares of stock that they have outstanding because they don't feel like they need it and they want to bring that in-house. They have sufficient cash. And you might have <coughs> reverse stock splits, which is uncommon, but a reverse stock split says if you have one share of stock, we're only going to we're gonna split it back to half a share. If you're owning those shares, it's a good thing because that means there's less shares to spread the dividend over and the earnings for the stock. What's a spinoff compared to a split off? A spinoff is a distribution of subsidiary stock to shareholders as a dividend. So you give that as a dividend and it's reduced a, um, and it reduces retained earnings. A split off is the exchange of a subsidiary stock owned by a company for shares in the company. So they're basically, that's the other way. They're, they're splitting off a subsidiary into something else. One example you might have heard of is there was a company called that uh, split off Kraft Foods because Kraft Foods fell under Philip Morris and they split it off so they had the food company. And I don't know if you know what Philip Morris is, but it's a tech tobacco company that sells cigarettes. And it's called something else now. I can't remember what it is. And the last part we're going to touch on is off balance sheet transactions. Uh, what are some of the off-balance sheet transactions and why are we doing it? And what are some examples of off-balance sheet financing? There's special purpose subsidiaries. You have trust, you trust preferred 
trust preferred city subsidiaries, these are some examples, real estate subsidiaries, mortgage securitizations, and Enron utilization. Let's highlight mortgage securitization. What they'll do is uh, a lender will group a large grouping of home loans together and they will bundle that as an asset and call it and they'll call it a security. So they might have 400 home loans from from Sacramento, California that they have made a, a, a vehicle and they sell those off to people and they become an asset but they're back to they're backed by the mortgage. And you have this last one called Enron Utilization. And what they're going to do is they're going to, I'm going to illustrate how, what a special purpose entity is with the transaction of selling a receivable. What it does is it's formed when the sponsoring company is capitalized with an equity investment, some of which must be from a third independent third party. The special proper purpose entity leverages this equity with borrowings from credit markets and purchases earning assets from the sponsoring company. So what that really says is a company establishes a, a special purpose entity to maybe sell off their receivables so they can have more cash on their balance sheet. And uh, they, so they transfer that those the receivables to the special purpose entity, typically at a discount. So the special purpose entity makes money by it, but they, they have a stronger ability to buy these assets called accounts receivables. So let's look at this diagram. So the sponsoring company sells its receivables to the special purpose entity. The special purpose entity has a security interest in the receivables and they ultimately sell those out into the bond market so they get cash. And then they get ca when they get the cash back in the pa cash passes from the special purpose entity back to the sponsoring company. It's one way for them to basically finance their, sell their receivables and get some money for it. If some of you guys that took principles one, you might call this factoring. It's way it's a way more complex form of factoring, but the the basic premise here is that they're factoring, they're selling off their receivables through the through the special purpose entity into the bond market. So the receivables might be, as I touched on earlier, a group of home loans, say in Sacramento. They push through this special purpose entity, which securitizes them and makes them a big group of loans sells it out into the bond market that support that's supported by these mortgages and the bond market gives cash back to the special purpose entity which flows through to the sponsoring company now the benefits they might provide lower cost financing alternative than borrowing from the credit markets and under gap so long as the SPE or the special property entity is properly structured the SP, SPE is accounted for as a special separate entity I'm consolidated with the sponsoring company. So that's typically what's going to happen with these special purpose entities. Off balance sheet financing continued. Off balance sheet financing in the simplest form, it's the non-recording of financing obligations. And why is it that way? They want to keep the debt off of the balance sheet and it, and it changes over time. And there was something that came out several years ago that's called FAS 133 which sets requirements for special for off balance sheet financing. It has to deal particularly with leases. And it was really driven by the issues that happened at Enron, the special purpose entity. And um, that's what they do, I mean, these off balance sheet financing. And some of the transactions to keep stuff off are, um, are one of the big ones is operating leases, which is different than capital leases. And we'll talk through that a little bit. And there's some other ones here, this take or pay where the company says they're gonna buy stuff whether they get it or not. And there's certain types of joint ventures and financing, and they'll sell receivables on the bottom here with recourse, and rather than liabilities, they'll sell receivables as a backing for debt sold to the public. That was the one that we just talked about with the SPE, and then outstanding loan commitments. So how do we analyze the off balance sheet? Look at the notes in the MBA and SEC filings for the company to see what type of off balance sheet financing they have. And I would hope that you would provide some of this information in your, I would expect that you would provide some of this information in your analysis of your companies. Look at the terms of the instrument. What's the collateral of security, if any, for the, at the amount of risk? Um, and what's the information about inf information about concentrations of credit risk, et cetera? Um, What's a useful analysis? You want to scrutinize the management communication and press releases. Analyze notes about the financing arrangements. What are they doing? 
uh, see if there's something that they don't want to disclose because there's always a bias not to disclose and look at the SEC filings for the details of financial arrangements. Uh, commitments and contingencies, there are differences between those two. What's, what's the basic difference between a commitment and a contingency? Well, a contingency is something that has several things that are going to happen that has to be reported. It's probable and the amount is reasonably estimated, estimatable and you have, that's a contingent liability. Now, a contingent asset is potential additions to resources, so they want to do look at both. Let's talk it simply about a contingent liability for a minute. A contingent liability might be a lawsuit that the company thinks that they're going to have to pay, and they have a pretty good idea how much it's going to cost. That's a contingent liability. The one that you study pretty much in principles one or in most accounting classes is warranties. Companies have contingent liabilities for warranties. So let's talk about another one for just a minute. Let's say you're in the NFL, and this particular year, I don't know if any of you remember, but they're supposed to have the Hall of Fame game at the NFL um, in August, and they canceled the game because of poor field conditions. Well, as soon as they did that, the NFL, based off of what happened in Dallas when they had the issue with the Super Bowl, realized they were probably going to get sued for the people that spent all that money to go to the Hall of Fame game and see their heroes play in the NFL in the Hall of Fame game. Well, when they know that, they know that they're going to have contingent liability, that they're probably going to have to pay the people that were going to go to the game, the NFL fans. That becomes a, that becomes a contingent liability. Now, is it probable that they're going to get sued? I think it's highly probable they'll get sued. In the amount of the loss, they, have a pretty good, they don't have a good idea yet, but I bet you by now they have a, a reasonable estimate based off of their experience in Dallas as a benchmark to show or to to come up with about how much they're going to lose or how much they're going to have to set up as a liability on their balance sheet. So that's just one simple example of a contingent liability, but I thought you might find that one interesting, so I would share that with you. How you look at contingencies? Again, look at the notes, MD&A, deferred, and deferred tax disclosures. So what's really important here, <coughs> excuse me, you can read through, uh, look at all the different financial information on a business, but the biggest thing is really to look at the notes in the MD&A. I mean, it might be worth it for you when you start analyzing your company and your and your comparison company to go look at, the, read the notes and the management discussion and analysis first, and then go back and see how it's reflected in the financial statements. Because there's going to be a note for every section on the balance sheet, and you want to understand those. And you want to look at these ones here. It says, look at management estimates of what they're doing. Look at the degree of risk that's associated with it. Recognize biases because businesses want to underestimate liabilities. Unless, of course, they're going to have a major problem with their business. Then they do something called the big bath. And I think we touched on that already. And that's like dumping everything in, that you can all at once. Look at the deferred tax notice and see if there's any future losses. And look at loss reserves and validate for risk exposure and that sort of thing. Now, commitments, on the other hand, are a little bit different. Commitments are things that the company, potential claims against the company, the resources due to future payments. The key word here is contract, okay? Sources for useful information. It sounds like a broken record, but we added one here. No it's in the MD&A, and now SEC filings. You want to look at the communications and press releases, analyze the notes and commitments, including the description, recognize the bias again to not disclose commitments, just like contingencies, and look at the SEC filings for details of commitments. Leases, leasing facts. This one's kind of interesting. A lease is a contractual obligation between, and I'm gonna read this, between a leaseor, owner, and a leasee, user, user or renter. That gives the leasee the right to use an asset owned by the leasee for a term of a lease. Typically, what you just what I just read there is a operating lease. They pay a certain amount of money, and at the end of the lease, you got to pay it. You got to they come back in and they get it. So if you go into a little local rental shop and you rent, a, say a a scissors lift for a year, and they you use it every month or a forklift, that's an operating lease. Because at the end of the year, you have to give it back to them. Now, if there's a a bargain payment option at the end that's really more like a capital lease. Now you have minimum lease payments based off of the lease. That's the big thing there. And how do we account for that? We also have capital leases. Capital leases are different. 
capital leases might be for us in our terms we might look at it like if you buy a if you lease a car you go to the toyota dealership and you lease a car when you lease that car they might have a bargain purchase option when you are done with your lease that becomes a capital lease and capital leases are going to go on the balance sheet to show that they that the company owns those and you're going to find out about those in notes and you want to look at some of the stuff about how they deal with it see here where it says a lease classifies an account for a lease as a capital lease if it's at inception at least it, it meets it meets um uh, any of the four criteria the lease transfers ownership of the property the lease contains an option to purchase the property at the bargain purchase price 75 percent or more of the economic life and the present value of the rentals or minimum lease payments is greater than 90 percent more of the fair value of the lease property these are all conditions that are laid out in the gap and then you have operating leases which is different where they're just paying month by month okay and that's the end of the slide presentation here um, I hope that uh, this was good, and I'll see you in Chapter 4. Have a great day.